Well, Jack, we're here today to talk about Predator. Not to be confused with Predators, or The Predator, or Alien vs. Predator, or Alien Predator. So we're talking about the one with the guy from Lethal Weapon. Sort of, yeah. That's true. <laughs> Predator! Predator! Uh, 1987, mm -hmm. one of the best action movies ever made. Uh, followed up a year later, John McTiernan, same guy who directed Predator, made Die Hard. Mm -hmm. Also one of the best action movies uh, ever made. You know, Predator is, is so, rewatching it after so long, it's so fascinating. Because it's an action movie in the sense that Alien is a sci-fi movie, where really it's this, it's an action movie, but it's a hidden slasher flick. Yes, yeah, so I was gonna mention that. It's, it's a lot of different genres in one, and it's, it reminds me, looking back on it, of From Dust Till Dawn, where it's like the characters think they're in one type of movie, and then all of a sudden, bam, they get interrupted by another type of movie, and then they have to deal with that. It's, yeah, <laughs> and so it's this you know commando esque schlocky action movie that that gets gets like creeped on by a horror movie. Yeah, and it's beautiful. Well, by a horror movie and simultaneously a sci-fi movie because it's an alien from outer space. Right. Uh, and it starts off, I, I guess, real briefly, the basic setup is uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger has a team of mercenaries that are hired by Carl Weathers mm -hmm. to, to go in and rescue these uh, refugees in Central America. And while they're there, uh, they discover that Carl Weathers actually had other plans for them. But more important than that, they are being stalked and preyed on by an alien from outer space. <laughs> that is on Earth for the sole purpose of sport basically of hunting humans of game hunting and so yes. they're, they're like oh fuck now we gotta deal with this situation and that's that's it it's like the simplest premise ever there's no standard film structure to this it just descends <laughs> it just unfolds <laughs> there there is in the sense of like we always talk about the structure when you have a monster movie of like you wait 30 minutes before you show the monster mm -hmm. and it kind of follows that a little bit there's a couple little hints early on of the predator <laughs> Uh, I think it's like 45 minutes in when he finally takes off his cloaking uh, device. Sure. And it's the first time you actually see him. Just briefly. But just, just briefly, there's little glimpses of him. They don't blow their wad early on. Mm. I actually wish there was less. Because the movie starts out, it's the exact same opening as The Thing, which is we see Earth, we see an alien spaceship fly down and hit the Earth. And in both movies, I wish they didn't have that. I wish you were dropped into this commando situation and then you, along with the characters, realized what was happening. Because that's the way uh, From Dust Till Dawn is. They have no idea they're in a vampire movie until halfway through the movie. <laughs> I agree with that. And, you know, listening to some of the behind the scenes featurettes uh, on the Blu-ray, uh, that was added later. That was mm -hmm. added without, I think, without even the director knowing. I think the studio Jeez. added that. Um, but even then, you forget about that alien spaceship by the time Carl Weathers and Arnold are doing their handshake. <laughs> you son of a bitch. What spaceship? That's Nothing, true. None of that matters. Yeah. Because of muscles. Because muscles. This and is the, the manliest movie ever made. Bunch of slack-jawed faggots around here. This stuff will make you a goddamn sexual tyrannosaurus. Just like me. I, I think that's what I love most about Predator is it's the movie that your dad rented because he thought it was Commando. Yes, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like it tricks you. Yep. Because that opening action scene, we got, well, we set up our characters. We got Carl Weathers, we got Arnold Schwarzenegger, we've got uh, Jesse the Body Ventura. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, I guess he was the body at the time, but now he's known as the mind. Now he's the mind, although he shouldn't even be that anymore. But... No, now he's the lost. <laughs> You have Shane Black, who is a screenwriter who wrote Lethal Weapon, and you know he's doing the new Predator, which is kind of neat. The other day, I went up to my girlfriend. I said, you know, I'd like a little pussy. She said, me too. Mine's as big as a house. But the reason, I guess the reason he was cast in the movie is because they wanted someone to punch up the script while they were making it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that shows there's lots of very clearly Shane Black-esque lines in the script. Delivered um, mostly by Shane Black. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. The most famous one in the movie, I think, is... Uh, You're hit. You're bleeding, man. 
I ain't got time to bleed. And that's Jesse Ventura. <laughs> but people always quote that as like, oh, that's so badass. They always ignore what happens right after that. I ain't got time to bleed. Oh. Okay. That's what, that's what sells that line. Like, he's acknowledging that it's absurd. <laughs> Little comedy moment there. Like, like, all right, dude. But you got, yeah, so you got Poncho, who is not Shane Black, right? Who, who is the only other not ridiculously buff guy that's not Shane Black? It, it's confusing because you have Shane Black and then you have the guy who looks just like Shane Black but doesn't have glasses. Mm -hmm. uh, you got Bill Duke. Uh, and then, who am I missing? You oh, got Billy. Billy, yeah. And Lady, who they pick up along the way. And Lady, the who way. they pick up along the way. Yeah. Who just kind of stares off for most of the movie. But you got these guys, these 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 big 80s action movie guys, and you have, they infiltrate the camp, mm -hmm. and it's just the most excessive, ridiculous display of guns and violence. Because, because it's a sneaky horror movie, they knew that they could take an entire movie's worth of action sequences <laughs> and just do it on one go. Yeah. And it was great. Explosions, stuntmen, falling into lakes. Classic Arnold puns. Yeah. Stick around. Which are terribly out of place later on in the movie, but yeah. They are, well the movie, it kind of like, all those elements sort of get stripped away as the movie goes along. So then by the end, when it's just the Predator and Arnold, it's like it's just this primal thing. They get cut, slashed <laughs> away. They get slashed away. <laughs> yeah, but and like a lot of that action, uh, I, uh, again, reading uh, or listening to a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, uh, the guys that shot all that action stuff was like the A-team guys. It's where well, you get lots of people falling, mm. you get people on fire. You get people falling while on fire. It's every, everything you want. And one of the guys, there's a part when Arnold goes into one of the huts and he shoots a guy that goes flying through the wall. Knock, knock. That guy that gets shot through the wall is Sven Ol Thorsen, who is like a good buddy of Arnold Schwarzenegger's. Uh, and he was like a stunt man in his own right. He's mm -hmm. in a bunch of movies. He's actually the, the head of mall security in Mall Rats. Oh, that sure. guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but more, most importantly, he was in another movie with Jesse Ventura. He was in Abraxas. He was the villain in Abraxas. Testing will result in discorporation. Testing will result in discorporation. Abraxas, the touching story of uh, uh, Jesse Ventura falling in love with a little boy. Do you want to sit up here with me? I'll tell you a story. It's about two men. John McTiernan, who directed this, he was like, for a while, he was like one of the best action directors. I mean, this, Die Hard, um, I like Last Action Hero. I know that movie's kind of got a mixed reception, but That's I think it's good. fun. Uh, but yeah, he, he, you know, he directed lots of great movies until he was uh, directed to prison for perjury. But oh. that's a whole other story. <laughs> Rewatching this movie, I noticed how contemporary it feels. It doesn't feel like a dated 80s action movie, mm -hmm. like a lot of movies from that era, like a Commando or something, which is the best movie ever made, but Obviously. that's because it's so dated and silly. <laughs> but this movie, like, it feels like a modern movie, and I think it's just the way John McTiernan shot action and the way he edited, like lots of uh, lots of fluid camera work, lots of lots more coverage, lots more angles than a lot of movies from that era. Well, it, lots it, of quicker cutting. Like it really, it does not feel like like a corny old movie. It still feels like a modern movie. Predator is an incredibly balanced movie, like uh, on an editing side, where mm -hmm. they have they do have these long, fluid shots, and then you know a little quick cuts here and there, but then long. He, he knows when to use handhelds. Like now, every action scene, yeah, constant yeah. handheld. Uh, the go-to is always, I think this has become a meme, but there's one of the Taken movies where Liam Neeson is trying to jump over a fence and there's like 75 cuts of him <laughs> going over a fence. In a, in a 20 second span. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is a movie where, yeah, it, there's lots of, you know, lockdown shots, lots of slow moving shots. And then to punctuate the action, that's where the handheld kicks in. Well, and, and a lot of, there's a lot of... Um of artistry, uh, not just in the long shots, but you know, the, the take where it starts a focus follow away and then you rack focus to something close, you know, like there's a lot of effort put into these little moments that help build the tension. Yeah. Actually very, very heavy real jungle 
is cinematically not very interesting because you can't see anything. We would wind up going through and trimming out leaves so that you could see through at some distance. I think that's where John McTiernan kind of put his stamp on it, where he said, we're going to take our time. I love that, that base infiltration sequence where, you know, before the action kicks off and everyone's just kind of being sneaky. A lot of longer shots, really, really good craftsmanship. And, and in that sequence, too, when they're, they're sneaking up, they establish, I, I kind of... I haven't, I honestly don't think I've watched this whole movie since I was a little kid because I watched it so much as a little kid, I never needed to see it again. <laughs> but I kind of forgot how, I knew that it was sort of gory, but I kind of forgot how like uh, blunt some of the violence is. And so that sequence when they're sneaking up, we see, I think it's Sven Old Thorson, shoots someone in the head. And it's just really like matter of fact, like real grounded violence. You're yeah. like, ooh. And that kind of lets you know, like, the danger that they're getting into. No! Run! Showcasing, actually, I think, I think this is this movie because you know, this is relatively early in Arnold's career. Yeah, relative to his entire career, obviously. Right. But this was the height. <laughs> this is '80s '80s Arnold. <laughs> well, I think I think a lot of this movie showcases why he succeeded so much as an actor. His expressions yeah. are amazing. And you can, like, he just has really expressive eyes and you can see that he was trying to emote and act. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the key, he was trying. There, there's, I don't think Arnold could have been a star any other decade or could have risen to that level of stardom in any other decade. Yeah. People were willing to, for, like, cause I, in rewatching this, some of his line delivery, you're kind of like, oh. My men are not expendable. And I don't do this kind of work. Major! But he has so much charisma, and you can you you like him just because you can tell he is trying. <laughs> um, the closest equivalent we have now to like someone who gets by on just sheer charisma is The Rock. Mm. The difference be well, one, The Rock can actually act, so mm. that's a difference. But the other big difference is that every movie The Rock is in is like complete garbage. He does nothing but crap, and people still love him. He's, he seems like a really likable guy. He does, and that he gets by completely. <laughs> Arnold, not a great actor yeah. in lots of really great movies. Yeah. The Rock, everybody loves him despite the fact that he's a good actor, but he's in terrible movies. <laughs> and they all take place in the jungle. Do it. Do it! Come on, come on. Kill me, I'm here, kill me! This is where, this movie is where everyone learned their Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. Kill me, do it now! Yeah, do it now! Yeah, yeah, you can do it. The only other addition would come with Total Recall, which is just the Arnold's agony noises. I, th I think, you know, because of Arnold's expressiveness, in fact, all the actors' expressiveness, and just the, the clever way it's shot, uh, I think a lot of Predator can be watched without any sound, and you will understand exactly what is going on. You miss out on some great one-liners. But, uh, yeah, no, it's, and like I mentioned earlier, the way the movie kind of strips down as it goes along, like, it, it strips out the, the action movie one-liners, it strips out the characters mm -hmm. as it goes along, and then by the end, when I say I watched this movie a lot as a kid, what I should say is I watched the last half hour a lot as a kid, when it's just Arnold versus Predator and there's hardly any dialogue. Mm -hmm. It's just so like primal and simple. And that's that like, so as the movie goes along, everything just gets stripped away until that's all you're left with is, is two things in the jungle fighting each other. It's great. <laughs> two, two, two slabs of steak <laughs> just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great, but but it's also like clever, and you understand what's going on. You know, Arnold building his Boy Scout traps, and the predators doing his predator things. Like yeah. you get it, you get it all, and there's no dialogue. And I think, I think that it, it reminds me a lot of there was a series of of comic books, kind of in the in the early 2000s, called uh, Nuff Said. And it was basically an experiment, an exercise in, in drawing comics where, like, can we make an entire comic book with no dialogue? Hmm. Like, just through art alone. And uh, they, were pretty, they were pretty neat. 
Uh, and, and it reminded me a lot of that where it's just like, I, I would guess that you could strip away every element of dialogue and understand exactly what is happening in Predator. Well, that's, they, they never over explain the Predator, which is great, which we should talk, I guess now we should talk about the Predator. Yes. One of the best movie monsters ever. But yeah, you, you, you get to understand what's going on with him without a lot of over explanation. There isn't like that scene where they, where our heroes kind of stumble upon I don't know, some piece of exposition or a character that knows what's going on that explains everything about the Predator to them. Right. But you get it. Like, the Predator is just here to hunt, which is so great. He's got technology, so he's a little futuristic. He he has his rituals. You know, like, there's so many great little pieces of, like, Predator lore. Every piece. Every, every, that's what I love about the Predator. Not only the design, but every piece of tech he has, everything about him is so clearly thought out. Yeah. And everything is awesome. No, and that, like that shoulder cannon, you know, that, that sequence when Arnold is, is hiding and you see the shoulder cannon perfectly follow where he's looking and you're just like, oh yeah, yeah. I get it. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I get it with no, no, no exposition. Like the, the fact that all we've seen the Predator do is like disembowel and skin people. But then, when, when Billy challenges him to a duel, yeah. the Predator removes his skull and the spine. Because that was, that was more of a challenge, not just skinning. He's, yeah. he's earned a trophy in combat, and you're like, oh, we didn't even get to see the fight, but you get it. <laughs> like there, there well, that's are... the thing is, we don't see the fight because he's, uh, Billy's given like a more dignified death. Mm -hmm. All the other characters, the Predator just dispatches them, and we see it in gory detail. Yeah, yeah. But Billy's a little, little uh, more advanced than that. Well, because you know, Billy, puts, it, it, Billy understands what's happening. Even yeah. though as the audience, we don't necessarily understand what's happening. Billy gets it, and he's ready for you know one-to-one -one combat. He loses, of course. <laughs> wow. But, but then he gets, he earns, uh, you know, the Predator earns his trophy and just like yeah. little pieces of lore that are never, like there's, there's never like the hologram. Yeah. Going like, let me tell you about the Predator. Yeah. yeah. Another, another creature from space that the, our characters run into that explains it all to them. <laughs> and they, they do a good job. I know some people don't like Predator too, but they do a good job on like subtly expanding on that stuff in the second movie too. Mm. Like, some of there's a little bit in the first one, but we see a little bit more of like the predator's technology as far as like uh, medical, uh, like ex like fixing itself if it has a wound. Sure. And then at the end, Danny Glover kills one of the predators, so they give it they give him like a gun. Seventeen fifteen. Like his trophy for killing a predator, right. but also it shows like oh the predators have been coming to Earth for a long fucking time. <laughs> It's so a little, little things like that that I, that I like. They never over explain it. You're one ugly motherfucker. And the design, the late great Stan Winston Predator design, the, the little vagina mouth, uh, the dreadlocks. Well, you know, the vagina mouth wasn't Stan Winston. No. Oh. Uh, according to the according to the rumors, according to Stan Winston himself, in fact, Stan Winston was uh, was contacted to you know make the Predator after they had already failed to make their own Predator. Oh yeah, I guess we should talk about that a bit too. The goofy but... bug monster. Yeah, yeah. Which uh, famously was originally cast Jean Claude Van Damme as the Predator. Mm. Uh, I, I don't know if this is completely true. I really hope it is. But they were filming. Uh, for the, the Predator's like cloaking vision, they had this completely red suit because they needed something that they could key out in the jungle. Yeah, yeah. So it couldn't be blue and it couldn't be green because it's the sky and the trees. So they had this like red suit in the shape of the Predator. And supposedly Jean-Claude Van Damme was uncomfortable because he thought that was the monster. I really hope that's true because that's amazing. That sounds <laughs> true. I, I've also heard that he didn't like that you didn't see him. Well, that, that would make sense, <laughs> that too. Would, that be, might be more true. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it looked like something straight out of, um, what was that movie with the uh, Meet the Andersons? Where they were big, uh, big uh, what, are, what do you call it? Praying Mantis monsters. Oh, Meet the Applegates? Meet the Applegates. I can't believe you remember that movie. Of course. <laughs> Yeah. 
It, it looked like a big dumb praying mantis. Yeah. And like you said, it's all like, and it's not even red. It's like pinky salmony red. It's it looks it looks like a muppet. It looks yeah. like a joke. And they knew right away that they needed something better. Yeah. So well, you need something, and th this is a lot of movies. Like when they have a monster, sometimes it can be distracting when it just looks like a person in a suit. Mm. Like some some shots in Alien where it's clearly got like most of the way that movie shot is like brilliant and perfect. But yeah. there's some parts where you can tell it's a person. But that works for Predator because it's like, oh, that might be why he likes to come down to Earth and hunt because it's something that's similar to yeah. him. He's so a it, humanoid alien. It's yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, it completely makes sense in that context. So, so after their first failure at the Predator, uh, because uh, Arnold was good friends with Stan Winston after the Terminator, hmm. Arnold apparently called up his buddy and said, can you make us a better monster? <laughs> and the story goes, according to Stan Winston, that he was on a plane with James Cameron hmm. and, you know, sketching up the, the, the dreadlock mask monster that we know. And James, it was James Cameron's idea to give him the mandible mouth. Okay. According to the legend, uh, James Cameron wanted more horrific vagina monsters. And so <laughs> I don't know what James Cameron has against vaginas, but... Well, I was going to say, there's probably a way you could look at this movie as being, like, the most misogynistic movie ever made, because you have all the manliest men ever being destroyed by a vagina. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta drop a tree trunk on that vagina. Oh, the tree trunk. You got to drop a log on it. <laughs> a nice hard log. Yeah, yeah, I see oh what they're going God. for. Oh my God. And the person who talks about vaginas is the first on-camera kill of the Predator. I'd like a little pussy. Jeez, you got a big pussy. Ah! We got it. We got it. We got a, we got a thesis now. The unintended misogyny of Predator. <laughs> <laughs> That's the clickbait title of this video. There you by go. By the way. <laughs> Oh, it's no, not unintended. You have to make it, if it's a clickbait title, you have to make it sound like that was their secret. Intent. The hidden. The hidden misogyny of, of Predator. That's it. Yeah. I, I know, I, I think this movie is incredibly, it's that kind of masculinity that I think defined like our parents' generation. Where yeah. just like, the only thing that matters is muscles. You had Arnold, you had Stallone, and then a little bit later, Jean-Claude Van Damme, to a slightly, to a much Lundgren's. lesser extent, Dolph Lundgren. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, and just everybody like, and, and the, just the way, the, fucking the opening scene of this movie is just two muscles, seeing which muscle can be <laughs> musclier. I know that's a, a super memed shot, that's, but it's, it's it's hilarious, and I think unlike a lot of action movies from that time, it's self-aware mm -hmm. hilarious. Like, I feel like that shot is a wink to the audience, like, we know what we're doing. Well, but, uh, like, just everything Arnold in this movie is an excuse to show off his muscles. Yeah. Like, you know, there, there's one sequence where he is kind of uh, uh, our... Billy, Billy, our, our tracker, is really spooked, and Arnold is kind of walking up slowly to him, and he's holding his gun... <laughs> In a way that no human being would ever <laughs> hold a big rifle. Yeah. But it, but it's, it's showing off his bicep, and that's all that matters. As he's walking and just showing off his muscles. Yeah. Every time he does like a commando signal, it's just muscle. Yeah. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. Well, and you know, like it's like that the handshake scene. It's a wink nod to the audience. I'm sure. But it's also a bit of characterization between the two of them. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, no, we're macho men. We like to goof around the power structure. It's, yeah. There's some art in the muscle. You're not going yet. Look, the rendezvous is 10 to 12 miles away from here. You think the chopper's going to wait? Dylan, we make a stand now. Or well, there would be nobody left to go to the chopper. Well, there's this great thing that the movie does. Usually in, a, in like a movie where you have characters in a situation where their their lives are at stake, like a, especially like a slasher movie, which this is sort of a slasher movie, it's, it's all about the characters trying to figure out just how to get out of the situation alive. And I love in this movie, they don't, they don't do that. They say, let's just stay here until we kill this fucking thing. If it bleeds, we can kill it. For for how like you know big and dumb they all are, you're like, oh no, these are professional soldiers. These yeah. are the best of the best. They're not just gonna get to the chopper. They're yeah. not gonna run away. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, wait. When when is this? Well, that's after the that's after the deforestation, <laughs> <laughs> where they kill the forest. No, 
Oh, it's it's absurd and it's terrifying that all of these professional soldiers don't know what they're doing. They're just firing into the nothing. This is what they've been reduced to. Yeah, yeah. it's great. <laughs> well, and, you know, just it, whether this is clever directing or clever writing, you know, it mirrors that the first time where they, they come across the dead bodies. There was a firefight. They were shooting in all directions. Can't believe that Jim Harper walked in an ambush. I don't believe he did. I can't find a single track. They were shooting in all directions, but I can't find any tracks. And it was like, oh, that's really weird. And then they're doing the same thing later. <laughs> we see their descent into yeah. madness. It's that so parallels the thing, the movie The Thing, because it's like we see early on they in the thing, Kurt Russell goes to the, the camp and he sees everybody's dead and like, oh, this is weird. And then we see what happens at that camp essentially happen to the characters in the thing. So it kind of is similar to that. It's, it's also, it's funny just because like, I think Predator is also kind of like the, the illegitimate father to a lot of movies that we watch on Best of the Worst. I, I wanted to bring that up, yeah. This movie inspired an entire generation of, of terrible B-movie filmmakers that said, eh, you know, Predator, they just shot in the woods, we can just do that. <laughs> Predator 2. Yeah. I like that it uh, it continues the theme of the predator hunting in super warm locations. Because mm -hmm. for whatever reason, the movie came out in like 1990 and it takes place in the far distant future of 1997. I don't know why they only set it a few years in the future or in the future at all, but it's like this massive heat wave in LA. Sure. Uh, which is why it's more baffling in Alien versus Predator that they set it in Antarctica. It's like completely the opposite of everything that the Predator has been established as. They just needed a place. <laughs> it was a whatever. It was, that was, did you see Alien vs. Predator? It was a whatever. I, oh yeah. The whole was. movie was a whatever. <laughs> <laughs> they just needed a place. Like, we'll film it in the studio. It's Antarctica, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I like the contrast of the first movie's all in the jungle, the mm. second movie's in the city. Sure. And there's this really clever opening shot where it's a helicopter shot of the jungle or what looks like the jungle, and then we pan over and realize it's like the hills oh, in LA, and okay. then we see you know downtown LA. And it's, it's, it suffers a bit. Have you watched it recently? Not recently. No, okay. I, I, I'm, I'm running on fumes as far as Predator 2 is concerned. Okay. It's, it's very like, like mean and sweaty, which I kind of like. All right. Uh, but it's very like cartoony direction. Like the first movie feels very like grounded and real. Yeah. And like if this, aside from some of the comical one-liners, but it's like if a Predator was you know, hunting you in the jungle, it, it feels like, oh, this is believable. And the, the second movie is directed by Stephen Hopkins, who did Nightmare on Elm Street 5. Bon appetit, bitch. Stylish movie as far as Nightmare on Elm Street sequels go, but for Predator, lots of like kind of wide angle lenses. It all looks kind of silly. Oh. It doesn't have that sort of grounded, real look of the first movie. Yeah, so yeah. it suffers from that. The weirdest thing in it, Gary Busey is in it. And there's a part when they're in like a meat packing plant. They, they lure the Predator into this meat packing plant. And there's all these slabs of cow hanging up. And we see, oh, that's something we didn't mention. The, maybe he didn't have it in the first movie, but he's got like this disc. He didn't have it in the first movie, but it's like disc. this with razors all around it. And so he throws that and it goes flying through and cuts things. And then it cuts through Gary Busey. But all we see, because there's things obscuring in the foreground, we just see his legs fall down and all this blood spew out. But the, just the legs fall down. I was like, what happened to the top half of his body? Is was he holding on to something? Is it just floating? That was always bizarre to me. <laughs> we, we did a commentary track for Alien vs. Predator. Mm. And this was a few years ago now. And I think we even said at some point in it, like, oh, none of us have seen Alien vs. Predator Requiem. Maybe we should watch that at some point. Still haven't done it. Because why? Don't care. Because why? The biggest detriment for that, for me, like, because I heard it was R-rated, like, because Alien vs. Predator was PG-13. So it's like, oh, it's R-rated, it's supposed to be really violent. But then what I had heard is that they color graded the movie so dark that you could barely see what's happening in it. Uh, well, I guess we'll have to see it now on the next review. <laughs> Keep it here. For that, that'll, that'll definitely be the next review. The very next review. Yes, we will definitely watch that film. But those two movies kind of killed the franchise for a while. Mm. And then I liked Predators. 
it benefited from one going into it with low expectations. Sure. But it also benefited from keeping it simple, which is what the the, the previous two movies did. It's mm -hmm. not like because it's always that that kind of like idea with a sequel where you have to go bigger and more elaborate with the plot. It didn't really do that. It kept oh, it nice okay. and simple. Sure. It's it's sort of a soft reboot of the first movie, except now we're on the aliens' home worlds and we're being hunted on the home world. And well, and I know they do a couple similar things. Yeah, I haven't seen the movie, but I, I know they do a couple similar things. I, I I know you know if you look at Predator, it's kind of a uh, a Magnificent Seven situation, you know. Where yeah, you group have, of dudes. Group of dudes, each has their own speciality, and I know they did that with the, or Predators. Predators, yeah. Not the Predator, Predator. Oh, God damn you, sequels, just put numbers. <laughs> just put the numbers. <laughs> I never get confused about what you're talking about when you say Predator 2. <laughs> right? About Predators is, you know, a group of people, each with a different skill set, and that's, that's yeah. fun. And there's a, there's a part in Predators where we got the Predator uh, fighting down a dude with a samurai sword, which is pretty awesome. And it's not treated schlocky. Ooh. Like, it's actually treated like if this guy with this samurai sword that, you know, takes his culture very seriously. If he had to fight a Predator, this is what would happen. It's like, yeah, that's fine. Neat. I'll put it on my list. It's, it's okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the perfect, like, Sunday afternoon, it's okay movie. So, and that's, I'm curious about this new one, the Shane Black the Predator, yeah, like what they're going to do with that. I mean, it's Shane Black. You can't go wrong. Yeah, the trailers have been really like underwhelming, but I feel like that's it's hard to make a trailer for a Shane Black movie just because he always has such a like specific tone that's hard to capture in a trailer. I and I'll be honest, I haven't watched any trailer. Okay, it's that's probably a, good. A Predator movie that Shane Black's making, uh, we're done. Yeah, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. Everything's fine. Fair enough. I do hope though that this is the last Predator movie. And, and that Shane Black has a cameo in it as a character who is the last person to be killed by a predator. Because <laughs> then we would have a bookend. There you go. He's the first on-screen predator kill, and now he's the last. That, that would be great. And then we can just be done. If the movie makes money, it won't be the end. It'll never be the end. We'll no. get The Predator 2, which is actually Predator 5? Whatever. What are you guys doing? Just fucking stop it. Put, put, put numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Just put numbers. <laughs> <laughs>